We are back for installment number two of the Maryland Terrapins all-time football team with Coach Ralph Region. Today we're going to be doing wide receivers and tight ends. I'm excited for that. How you doing, Coach? I'm doing great. All right, how about yourself? Doing very good. Very excited to get into this second round. If you guys did not see the first one, we did quarterbacks and running backs. We'll put a link to that video in the description. So you can follow along with each one. There's going to be five of these two position groups per episode, and there'll be links for all of that. So you can follow each one. This is number two wide receivers and tight ends, and we are going to jump right into it. We're going to start with wide receivers, and we have two wide receivers on first, second, and third teams. And on the first team, I know people are gasping already because of someone who's not there who we'll get to in a second. But our first team. All wide receivers are Gary Collins, Torrey Smith, and we can start with Gary Collins because he was a surprise to me. I didn't really know of him, to be honest with you, Coach, before I started the project, and you really were the one who who brought him up to me and said, you got to research this guy, and the more I kept researching, I was like, wow, 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 more and more stuff. He's, he's only 16th all-time in yards and 7th in touchdowns. We can remember – he played 59 to 61, and we've talked about this in the other episode where, where there were many fewer games, fewer plays per game, and of those play, fewer passing plays. It was a very different game back then. At the time he retired, he was the leader in all the statistical categories for wide receivers. And he was an All-American, first team, two-time, first team all-conference, and the number four overall pick in the NFL draft. He might be the best receiver in Maryland history, Coach. I think so. Oh, I think so. And, and uh, you know, he's a big, tall guy, about 6'5", about 220 pounds. Played with the Cre Cleveland Browns for like 15 years. He also was a great punter. And if I'm if I'm not wrong, I think he made the, uh, the College Hall of Fame and also the NFL Hall of Fame. I didn't see him listed as College Hall of Fame. I'm not sure about the NFL Hall of Fame because I didn't. I thought I thought you told me that, so that's why I mentioned it. Maybe uh, let me let me look in the College Hall of Fame. I do have all of it listed here. Maryland College Hall of Fame players. We have uh, okay. There are nine of them. He is not okay. He is not one. Um, but he in the NFL, I did notice that he was a three-time All-Pro and was on the NFL All-Decade team in the '60s. Right. I don't know if he made the NFL Hall of Fame. I would think I would think he is great player. So yeah. clearly, uh, especially with those accolades while at Maryland. Right. He was like, you know, when I came to Maryland, you know, he he had already finished, but he was already doing very well in the pros, and then everybody talked about what a great player he was and what a really great person he was. So. That's why I remembered him. And when we were talking about this, uh, I said, you know, I, I saw that all the work you had done. I said, you know, you're missing maybe the most valuable guy of all in, in Gary Collins. And then yeah. I never heard of the guy. And I said, well, that's why you got an old guy like me. on the. On the that is exactly <laughs> why, Coach. And I thought I had done all the, the proper research. But for some reason, when I was calculating stuff, I think it's because his statistical numbers are so low. And it, but that's just obviously because he played so long ago. They're great probably, numbers for the era he was in. You're never going to be right. I mean, it's all subjective. Yeah. Right. Different eras playing, but at the time, he was he was one of the outstanding wide receivers of his time. And right. I can say that so in college yeah. and pro. So clearly, number four overall pick, and he's the only wide receiver ever to be an All American at. Maryland. So there you go. The other one, the other wide receiver on the first team is Torrey Smith. He played from 2008 to 2010. He's third all time in receiving yards, second all time in receiving touchdowns. He was ACC first team in 2010 and the number 58 overall pick in the NFL draft, coach. Wonderful kid. I mean, um, Tom Bratton recruited him and, and Torrey, um, uh, I think he broke his leg his senior year. And um, Tom had, had looked at junior film of him, and he was a quarterback. And Tom said, I, you know, he was worth me going to visit. So I went down there and visited him and was overly impressed. 
I think he had seven siblings. His mom worked at night. He would get all of the kids ready to go to school. I looked at his transcript. He was an outstanding student, uh, just an outstanding person. So I, I offered him a scholarship. He didn't, he didn't have anybody else offer him a scholarship till I offered him. Really? And, and then Virginia and Virginia Tech came in and Clemson and everybody else. But because I offered him first, he, he stuck with me, which that's a rarity in itself. But um, the kid was, he, he's just a great character kid. I think he's got a foundation now. He's working in Baltimore, with, played very well for the for the Ravens. And, and um, you know, he, he came to Maryland and was more than I thought he would be, not from a lack of talent, just – he just wasn't recruited very much. And, uh, you know, he was a diamond in the rough, to be honest with you. And I'm so happy that he played for me and I had an opportunity to coach him, but that I got to know him was really, really special for me. And I always think very good thoughts of, of Tory. And he was such a team player, such a good person. He's going to be a tr tremendous uh, contributor to our society. And not only that, he'll, he'll come up a second time when we get the special teams coach. He's one of the few guys who shows up on this thing twice. So there you go. There's the wide receivers first team. And now we'll go on to the second team. And there's there's the guy that all the modern people are, are probably wondering about. Why is he not on the first team? Stefan Diggs. He played from 2012 to 2014. One of the most beloved Terps, at least in current modern day. Uh, partially because of what he's done in the NFL is one of the best receivers there, but he at Maryland, the second all time in receiving yards, fifth all time in receiving touchdowns. He made the big 10 second team in 2014. Uh, the number 146 overall pick in the NFL draft, a you know, fifth round pick. He had injuries coach. And I think that hurt his numbers and hurt his overall production. Otherwise he probably would have been on the first team if not for those injuries. No question. I remember seeing him play as a junior, a sophomore and a junior at Good Council High School. Outstanding player, really, you know, has really come into his own in the NFL. And, you know, I, you know I'm kind of proud that he was a Terp and, and is doing well. But, uh, you know, if we're looking at people, how they did at Maryland, you know, I think injuries were a big factor with, with Stefan. Right. So while at Maryland – if you're comparing Stefan, for me, it was, it was Stefan versus uh, Tory. And if you look at it, it just for Tory was a first team. Stefan was a second team. Tory had more touchdowns. He was drafted higher. Uh, so it, it was a tough call for me, but uh, I agree that he should be on the second team here when you're looking at, at the all time numbers and, and accolades and those things. Jermaine Lewis is the other one on the second team and he, he holds every record for wide receivers still to this day. He played in the nineties. He, he played under Duffner with, with uh, Scott Milanovic as well, who used to hold all the quarterback numbers. They had the run and shoot that over emphasis on the passing game. Uh, he was a first team all ACC in 1995, third team in 93 he was a number 153 overall pick in the NFL draft. When I was coaching at San Diego Chargers, I, I came in and worked Jermaine out and uh, was impressed with his his, his physical abilities. Um, you know, I thought he had a, a real chance playing in pro football. Uh, we didn't draft him, but uh, I, we were interested enough that I made a trip to Maryland to, to work him out. So I knew he was an outstanding player. Had yeah. a return guy, too, I believe. Yeah, he well, he, you know, it's funny. He didn't. I was surprised because I'm, I'm a Ravens fan coach, and he was on the Ravens, and most famously had the one return for a touchdown in the Super Bowl. But he also did that in the regular season, and he made the Pro Bowl, I think, twice for for as a returner for special teams. But at Maryland, his statistics are not that great. He did not return very often. He only had uh, – we'll get to that when we get to the special teams, but I think he only had a couple hundred yards. Uh, he doesn't rank very high uh, in the special teams. All of his all of his stats come from the receiver spot. He's a tiny guy, but, yeah. man, was he fast. <laughs> and he he scored a lot, called a lot, everything. I think that's why, you know, they sent me to him. They, uh, they were interested in him as being a return person, so – yeah. Okay. Second team. And now we'll go on to our third team here. DJ Moore, 
and Darius Hayward Bay. Start with DJ Moore, who played in the teens, 2015 to 2017. He's sixth all-time in receiving yards, 2027. Third all-time in receiving touchdowns at 17. He made the Big Ten first team in 2017. He's the number 24 overall pick in the NFL draft coach. I recruited uh, him when I was at Rutgers, and, mm. and um, he really played very well for Maryland. And, yeah. Uh, and is is really a great pro and really doing well and you know he he's an outstanding receiver and very deserving of his spot on the team. Yeah, and uh, I'm very glad that you failed in that one instance, Coach. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah I know. I like to fail at anything. So. I, I I know I I know that I know that, but we're very happy that he was part of the Maryland Terrapins and not part of Rutgers, and he made this third team. The other guy on the third team here is Darius Hayward Bay. 2006 to 2008, fourth all-time in receiving yards, fourth all-time in receiving touchdowns, first all-time in rushing yards for a wide receiver, which is an interesting stat. All those ends around and reverse the sweep, whatever you want to call it. ACC second team in 2006, number seven or overall pick in the NFL draft. He might have been the fastest wide receiver that I've coached. He ran 4-2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ran 4-2-3. I remember um, – he ran that at the combine, and Frank Wright was was like was coaching. Uh, uh, I don't know where he was coaching at the time, but he he texted me and said, "Your boy just ran four two. Mm. I, said, I bet he ran four two three. I said he ran that every single time I tested him. So, um, you know, we ran a lot of reverses with him. I, I we were playing Miami, and um, I, I was calling plays, and he had already beat the kid one time, and we had the ball. I think inside the five yard line, and I threw a go route to him. He went 95 yards with it and beat the kid like a drum. You know, he could run. He could really run. And another great kid, great mom. You know, I'm, I'm really just privileged to be able to be associated with him. Yeah. Great player for the Terps and went on to the pros as well. Underrated wide receiver coach. We have G. Roy Simon. He played in the 90s, 93 to 96. Not some, not one of the big names. There's been a lot of big receivers recently who've overshadowed him, and the 90s weren't a great pe time period for Maryland, but one of the players that did stand out during that time period was G. Roy. Fifth all-time in receiving yards, eighth all-time in receiving touchdowns, second all-time in receptions, only second to Jermaine Lewis, and it's very close, actually. Um, and then he was a C ACC second team in 1994, uh, as our underrated wide receiver coach. I don't know him at all. I was in pro football at the time. And yeah. that's, that's the first time I heard of him. So, Oh, well, that might, that might've been more my pick than yours then. But <laughs> Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but this, you, know, you, you, you watched him. I didn't see him. I yeah. Said, yeah. I, well, that time in the those 90s. Were, those were the dark years for me as far as Maryland is concerned. They're the dark years. They, they, weren't, they weren't interested in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it might be the worst decade in Maryland. Well, in modern Maryland history, you go back to the teens and the 1800s. There's some weird records. But in terms of modern football, I think the 90s are probably the worst for Maryland. They just I think they, I think in 1990, exactly. They did go to a bowl game. They were and they tied. And no other year did they even have a winning. They didn't go to a bowl game. Um, it's funny because I won a national champ championship on 90 at Georgia Tech. Yeah, yeah, I know, Coach. I know. <laughs> we wish you would have done that at Maryland. That was uh, Krivak in 90, and then they, they went to Duffner and then to Vander Linden, and none of, none, none of those worked out very well. But G. Roy Simon was a blessing, in, one of the few bright spots during that time period. Second all-time receptions, like I said, from, from that time, you don't think of him as one of the great receivers in Maryland history, but the stats are really good, and, you know, his teams weren't great, but he was, in my opinion, a very underrated player. Let's go to, to the honorable mention wide receivers. We have a list here alphabetically. We'll start with, with someone who, who played uh, when you were the – a coordinator with Bobby Ross, Zizadine Abdurroof, probably the most fun name to say in Maryland history, Zizadine Abdurroof played from 84 to 87. 
at the time he was the fastest wide receiver he could run mm. and uh you know he was from the eastern shore of maryland and came and i think he worked in maryland with the m club you know while i was there also so we call him ziz but uh right Aziz Adin was was a really good player for Maryland and very much deserving of recognition. Yeah. Marcus Badgett, another one of the players in the 90s, probably in your dark period, Coach. But Marcus Badgett was a first-team all-conference player, one of the few that Maryland had in the 90s. And he's in the top 10 of all the receiving categories. I don't know. Do you know much about him? Not, not, I don't know anything. So much, about yeah. Okay, then we'll go on to Russell Davis, 81 to 83. He played with you uh, again during the 80s, uh, during the uh, Bobby Ross era. And he fit, he was uh, had decent numbers in, in the 10 to 12 range in receiving and touchdowns and receptions all time. Big, strong, a wide receiver. Uh, could get open. Uh, I think Boomer really liked throwing to him. We had a lot of good, really good receivers back then, and he he was one of them. Um, you know, they were all just kind of like our 2002 team. I, I think we had a lot of really good receivers, and and yet there was nobody that was, you know, they were all about the same. They're all pretty good, you know. So that 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 helps us, and that helped us back in the early 80s with uh, Coach Ross. So Russell is very much deserving to be on this uh, on this list. It's kind of interesting because when you talk about the 80s, and we've, we've talked about in the last episode, the five NFL quarterbacks not having very good statistics and it's because none of them could get a three- or four-year stretch. They all got two years max, maybe one or one and a half. And so their statistical numbers aren't as great. And the same thing with the running backs. You had Badonic and Blountain, who, three of them who were great, so they're sharing categories, so the, the statistics will go up. And I feel like a similar thing with the receivers. It's called teamwork. Right. When you've got a lot of good players and you win, you can get recognition that way, but you're not going to probably, you know, have a lot of great stats. The yeah. Big, the big stat you're going to have is you won. Right. And that's the most important stat in my book. Right. We have a, a modern player, Dante Dimas, who good finished player. up a couple years ago, and I feel like he had a chance to be higher on this list, maybe get into that second or third team range but he had that very bad knee injury in his junior year against iowa on the on the punt return which was just it was really sad devastating and he never recovered after that but despite that he still did get over two thousand receiving yards as a turn switch i thought he fought through it pretty good i remember i think his first game they played texas because i remember scheduling texas and I and I thought he had a really big game to beat Texas at, at Texas. So, yeah, I, I I was very impressed with Dante. And then we come to Daryl Hill, who only played one season with the Terps in 1963, and but a very good season: 43 receptions, 516 yards, and seven touchdowns. A great a great season. You parlay that out over a whole career, and he's up in the leaders. But he's here for a different reason, Coach. Well, he's in it because if he wasn't on it, he'd be calling me up right now. But uh, <laughs> Daryl, Daryl is uh, originally went to to the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and um, Lee Corso, who was coaching at Maryland at the time, he actually recruited me. Uh, talked Daryl into coming to Maryland and transfer from Navy, and he was the first Afro American. To play for Maryland or in the ACC, right? And um, you know, probably it was maybe my second or third year. I'm playing in a golf tournament in Atlanta for the Peach Bowl, and in my foursome is Lee Corso. And Lee Corso says to me, "You know, you should really call up Daryl Hill and bring him back to Maryland." I said, "Where, where is Daryl now?" He says, "He has a restaurant in Atlanta." I said, really? He said, if, if if you get that, he says, if you get him to come back, I'll get you to play Thursday night. So I thought this was a, he a heck of an opportunity. So I brought it up to the, you know, Debbie Al and everybody. They didn't know who Daryl Hill was. I said, Daryl Hill is the first Afro-American to play in the Atlantic Coast Conference. And I said, 
you know, he, he, he really is somebody that our players should know about. So I called him up <laughs> and I, I said, Daryl, this is Ralph Friedge. And he goes, yeah, right. <laughs> I said, no, it, it, it's me. Lee Corso told me to call you and, and um, we got him to come up and, and I had him speak to the team. And then Debbie liked him so much, she hired him as a fundraiser and he did a great job at fundraising. And I, I think the last I heard, he's still in the Maryland area. His, um, you know, he sold his restaurants. It was very, very successful businessman. But uh, he would come to our practices quite a bit. And, he, and I, I know he liked to coach the wide receivers, but he would also talk to them. And I think it was a great, it was great for our program, for our kids to learn what things were like back when he was playing. Because it isn't, it was a lot different than it is now. And I think he added a lot of insight to these kids and what what could happen and and what what is happened to a lot of our Afro American players. So I think it was a very important that they understand the history there. Yeah. And also partially why we include him on this on this list here too. Uh, we have Vernon Joins, 1985 to 1988. Good player. He he was um, he was a little bit. He played one year when I was there. I left in '86 or '85. We left, and then that was our last season. But Vernon was a freshman then, but he ended up being a good player for Maryland because we played against them. And you know they beat us when I, when we were down at uh, Georgia Tech the first couple of years. So I remember he was a very good player for him. Very good player. And the last one we have on the honor mention list is Jashawn Jones. He just finished up this past season, and he's he's kind of known for having six seasons because of medical redshirts and COVID. And he played 48 games, Coach, <laughs> uh, but he is across six seasons because he had some injuries. And But he is uh, one of the eight players to have over 2,000 receiving yards in his Maryland career. He also was very good at the end around or reverse, whatever you want to call it. He's second in rushing yards for receivers in Maryland history. And he did get two touchdowns rushing as well. He also threw one. He very famously in his first game threw a touchdown pass, caught a touchdown pass and rushed for a touchdown pass. Wow. That's it was his very first game. Yeah. That's pretty so, exciting. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's like, who's this guy? All right. And then it, it slowed down a little bit from there, right? He wasn't getting three touchdowns a game. But a good Terp overall, 14 total touchdowns, receiving and rushing. And so that's why we have him on the honorable mention there. That's going to do it for our wide receivers. Now we're going to go on to the tight ends, our next group. And starting off on the first team, this guy was a monster he was part of those early 2000 teams that were great for you, Coach Vernon Davis. Played from 2003 to 2005. He's second all time in tight end receiving yards at Maryland. Second all time in tight end touchdowns. Third all time in tight, tight end receptions. He was a first team all ACC in 2005. First team All American in 2005 as well. And the number six overall pick in the NFL draft. That's how dominant he was. Really, really a good player, great kid. Um, you know, his grandmother did a great job of raising him, and, and um, I love her a lot. <laughs> She's just an outstanding person. I just went up and, and visited uh, Vernon. He won an outstanding uh, person award in D.C., and um, he looked great. He's doing very, very well. He's making movies now. Um, he's got an art uh, gallery. Uh, He's, he's just doing very, very well. I was very happy to see that. But really talented guy, could really run, uh, could play wide receiver. He's that, he was that good, of, uh, had that good of speed. The fact that he was, you know, I probably probably try to do too much with him too early. And Charlie Taft said, let's just make him a tight end. And I just saw all the things that he could do and how versatile he could be. And I should have probably just waited, but. He came out early, and uh, you know, I I was the one that suggested he do that because I knew he was going to go in the top ten, and uh, really with 
you know, really could help him the rest of his life and, and for his family. So, I'm, you know, I'm really, really proud to be associated with Vernon. I'm happy that uh, he's doing well and uh, his whole family's doing as well as can be expected right now after his brother passed away. I just remember watching him and just there would be plays where he would catch a short pass and run it 20, 30, 40 yards because, and people would be hanging on him. <laughs> He'd just be dragging, knocking people off the dragon. He was just so physically dominant, such a physical specimen. I would I went by, you know, his high school and uh, Coach Jeffries was the coach and he was telling me that when Vernon goes by the, um, the girl's bathroom, they come out and they throw water on him so he takes his shirt off. <laughs> I said, I used to have that problem myself. <laughs> but uh, he's a physical specimen now. He, yeah. he still looks like he can play. Yeah. So, I, you know. I never had that problem, Coach. Yeah. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> All right. Tight second team, Farrell Edmonds. Uh, he's first in all the tight end statistical categories, except for uh, receptions. He's first in receiving yards, 1,641, tied for first. Three tight ends, or is it three? Uh, no, he is first in uh, receiving touchdowns at 10. Second all-time in tight end receptions at 101. First team all-ACC in 1987. Number 73 overall pick in the NFL draft. Farrell Edmonds is really a great player. I mean, to me, it's really a hard decision between him and Vernon because – you know, both of them could run four or five or better. Farrell was like, you know, Vernon's like six two, six three. Farrell, uh, Farrell was probably six four, six five. Wasn't as quite as heavy as Vernon is, but um, he could block and he could run. And um, he he was one of these guys that you could run those clear out patterns. You know, drag them all the way across the field like they do in the NFL. Farrell could do those things and. Um, and really, it looks like his genes have passed down. He has three kids playing in the NFL right now. So, uh, truly, truly belongs on this team. Outstanding football player. Yes. And one of his kids, Trey, I believe, transferred from Virginia Tech to Maryland, and but only played a year or two. Didn't really work out as well as people had hoped. But you're right. He had so many of them that went on to the NFL. And didn't you say I don't? I'm sorry if you just said this, but you, maybe you just said it now, or if you said it in our prep meeting, that you felt like if you were still around, you would have gotten all his kids. <laughs> I, I would have had a good shot at him, I believe. But Earl yeah, brought me when when the kid was a sophomore, he brought him over to see me, and and uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, Farrell, we kind of recruited. We were recruiting the Covington brothers. And they and Farrell played in the same high school as them, and we were playing Virginia at Virginia. And Coach Ross sent us all out uh, to look at high school games. And Jimmy Cavanaugh was was um, went was went to see the Covingtons, and George Fasikas was recruiting the Covingtons. And Jimmy came back and said, "They got a a real tall, skinny tight end on that team. It's pretty good." And that's how we started recruiting Farrell, and he turned out to be a really good player. So we had three guys that were really outstanding players from the same high school in the same year, which is very, very rare. Yeah. yeah. Great tight end from the eighties, third team tight end, Frank Whitecheck, uh, another player who was not during your time frame in the early nineties, 90 to 92. He's first all time in receptions as a tight end, third in receiving yards, First all-time in rushing yards as a tight end, 391. He also ran for five touchdowns. So he's kind of a hybrid there, I think, a little bit, Coach. Second team, yeah, second team ACC in 91, 160 overall in the NFL draft. Sorry, go ahead. He, you know, he was he was great, very, very athletic tight end and pro football, very good uh, route runner, great hands. Of course, he made the big play in, in, uh, in the playoffs. Um you know, just proud that he went to Maryland. You know, he's just a, a legend as a tight end, both in Maryland and also in the NFL. Well, yeah, he has one of the most famous plays in NFL history, the 
what the Tennessee miracle, whatever they call it, when he threw it back uh, to him. Yeah. Or was it back? That's the question. It looked like it went forward, but well, it stood. Uh, Frank White. Doesn't matter now. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter now. It was ruled ruled a touchdown. So, yeah. So Frank White, a great uh, tight end for the Terps. This one's interesting here. We weren't quite sure what to do with this one here, Coach. For our underrated tight end, we have Bill Walker, who played from fifty three to fifty five. It's because neither of us really know much about him, but the accolades speak for themselves. So we put him on this underrated list. He was a second team All American with the AP in 1954 and a second team All American with the UPI, which both of those used to be, uh, used to put out top 25 polls and claim that All American teams and that kind of stuff. United Press International and the Associated Press, they were both well respected back then. But so he has two All America teams. And then he was a first-team ACC and then two second-team ACCs. And he was the number 96 pick in the draft. So these accolades are amazing. But not, you, you don't really remember him that much, Coach, he said. So no, we, I, I was probably, when he played, I probably was like six, seven years old. Now I'm old, but you know, he played in 53. <laughs> I was yeah. born in 47. So what's that, six years? I yeah. was six years old when he was playing. Well, 53 was the national championship team. And in 55, they were very close as well. They went 10 and 1 again. So they were in the national picture again in 55. So he had, he was on two very good teams. Tatum never had a bad team, by the way. But, yeah, so that's our underrated tight end, Bill Walker. And now we'll go to our honorable mention tight ends. We'll start with Dick Absher, who played while you were there, Coach, at least a little bit. He was 1964 to 1965. Big, strong, physical guy, boy. He was a great-looking kid, you know, and really a good blocker and a good receiver, good hands. And um, we weren't very good back then, but Dick was a, a, an outstanding player. Next, Chigazim Okonkwo, or Chig, as we call him. He is a recent player, coach, 2018 to 2021. And he's interesting because he – had 717 yards, eight receiving touchdowns, but he also had two rushing touchdowns for 10 total, tied for the most ever as a tight end at Maryland. And he's going on to to do well in the NFL as well. And I'm not sure. I think you he's past your time and even past your Rutgers time. So I don't know how much you know about uh I don't, know a, lot. I don't know a lot about him at all. So yeah. Okay, then we'll go on to John Tice played from 1979 to 1982 he's fourth in receiving yards and fourth in uh, uh receiving touchdowns as a tight end so he's just beneath those other guys we just listed outstanding blocker i mean he was like having an offensive tackle at tight end 6'5 maybe 245 250 um you know, Mike Tice, is, is his brother was a quarterback for Maryland, and John was a tight end. And um, John played in the NFL for quite a while and ended up coaching in the NFL, as well as Mike ended up being a you know uh, head coach in the NFL. So, um, really good player. Uh, he was on our '80s team, and uh, we were pretty good up front. We could we could run the football. We could we could throw. The, we could do both. We could run it and throw it. And then finally on the honorable mention team, Walter White, not of Breaking Bad fame. I don't know if you know Breaking Bad coach, the lead character's name, Walter White. But Maryland had a Walter White, too. He played in 1973 to 74 under Coach Claiborne. He's, it's very odd because he has very similar statistics to Chig. Eight receiving touchdowns and two rushing touchdowns. They both – I double-checked that. So they both had 10, and they're both tied – with Farrell Edmonds for the most touchdowns uh, as a tight end. What do you know about Walter White, Coach? Did you have I, I, him? I, 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 I had left uh, okay. in 73, but I knew Walter White when we were recruiting him. I believe he was a junior college transfer. Okay. I might be wrong on that, but the fact that he played 73 and 74 may, may, uh, may indicate that. But I knew he yeah. was. Highly recruited guy that we thought was going to be good. And I know he played in the NFL, I think, with Kansas City Chiefs. And um, good player, you know, uh, very athletic. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about 
I, I know he had pretty good stats for only two years. Very but. good stats. He only he played about half the games that Farrell played, but as if he had played the same amount of games, he might be number one in all the categories. But that's interesting because Coach Claiborne wasn't going to throw it a whole lot. I can tell you that. So the really? fact that he had good passing stats that's really that's really remarkable in the time he played. Right, fifty nine receptions, nine hundred and thirty yards, over a thousand total yards, counting as rushing yards as well. Wow. Pretty yeah, good. yeah. So there you go. There's our tight ends, honorable mentions, and that is going to do it for this episode. Wide receivers and tight ends, coach. Very excited. We're two down, three to go. The next one's going to be offensive line and defensive linemen. Before we go, coach, tell everybody how to get to your football by Freegen. It's on YouTube and uh, Instagram. Um, I. My daughter's back home now. Hopefully, we'll get, get something up here soon. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this kind of because people seem to like it. And I am just apologize that I haven't gotten more up there. But I'm, I'm working on it. I'm ready to go. I just got to get my daughter in gear. Yeah. You know? So we'll put a link to that. We'll also put a link to all the episodes in our description for this. And do us a favor, subscribe. You'll get all the notifications about when these episodes are going to come up as well. Thank you guys very much. This is IMS Radio.